Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Suranjali Seal and like I always say, if you are somebody that loves literature and is all about literature, then this is the channel for you. In our video today, we're going to discuss Socrates. Now, he is credited with being the founder of Western philosophy and he is known to be the father of philosophy. And because we have been already following the history of English literature, we have actually progressed up till the Caroline period and we've also discussed the metaphysical poets. Now, I was about to continue with that series and complete the Civil War Interregnum Restoration period, but I thought it would be very refreshing for us if we discuss uh, literary criticism a little bit. So I want to finish um, Aristotle, Plato and Socrates because they are the major Greek critics that we have and um, they also contributed immensely into philosophy, of course, but we do have literary criticism, which we have to cover as well. So in literary criticism, the Greek critics are the ones we're going to cover first. And the first person that we're going to talk about is Socrates. Then we'll move on to Plato and finally to Aristotle and we'll be done with the Greek critics. So I thought we'll just take a break from the history of English literature and refresh our minds with these interesting philosophies and ideas. And then again, go back to the Puritan period. OK, so in our video today, we're going to discuss Socrates. Now, now, before we move on into discussing and talking about his life, beliefs, philosophies, ideas, I thought of cre uh, clearing out one small doubt, okay? Sometimes Socrates, his name is pronounced as Socrates, which is wrong. Now, in some people might also argue that it might be the Indian English pronunciation, but in the Indian English pronunciation, also his name is pronounced as Socrates. That's his name. Now, the if you have watched Greek movies, if you've read about... Um, Greek myth and mythology, if you've read Greek literature, you would know that the E is always stressed, okay, mostly, not always, that would be wrong, but the E is sometimes stressed, okay, in the names. So, for example, if you consider Hades, Hades is the god or the king of the underworld. So, if you look at his spelling, it looks as if it's Hades, but it's actually Hades, it's pronounced as Hades. Then Aphrodite, okay, she's a god, goddess of uh, fertility and uh, she's the goddess of fertility and love. So Aphrodite, if you look at her spelling also, it seems as if it's Aphrodite, but actually it's Aphrodite, it's pronounced as that. And then you have Athena, it's not Athena, of course it's Athens, the city of Athens, but the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom, her name is pronounced as Athena, the E is again stressed. And then Aries, Aries, if you look at the spelling again, it looks as if it's Ars, A-R-E-S, but then it's pronounced as Aries. Similarly, when we talk about Socrates, it's not Socrates, it's Socrates, okay? So with that out of the way, now let's just get right into it. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the concrete facts which we need to remember about Socrates. Now, if you have watched my other videos, you would know that I do it in every other video. We actually cover some concrete, unchangeable facts about the writers. And then we move on to their works, their beliefs and ideas. Okay, so first we're going to look at these unchangeable facts which we need to know as students of literature as far as Socrates is concerned. So he was uh, a Greek philosopher. We know that. Uh, he was born in Athens around 469 BC and uh, this is the present day Athens, a picture I've just included for reference. So he was born in Athens around 469 BC, served in the Athenian army. He is credited as the founder of Western philosophy. So the first thing that should come to your mind right now is what is Eastern philosophy? If there's a Western philosophy, that therefore it must mean that there's an Eastern philosophy too and there's a distinction between the two, right? So we will have to know this just in brief. If you want me to actually discuss Western and Eastern philosophy in detail, I can do that. Do comment down below if you want me to discuss it. I'll uh, discuss it if you want me to, but after we finish uh, literary criticism and um, um, uh, history of English literature. So for now, let's just focus a little bit on Western philosophy, what it's all about. Okay, so Western philosophy is the philosophies that originated in Europe and Northern America, whereas Eastern philosophy is the are the philosophies which actually originated in Asia. And there's a, dis a difference between the two. The Eastern philosophies, they focus on collectivism, okay, collectivism, and Western philosophies focus on individualism, okay, so this is a little distinction which you would know, Western philosophies, there's no close connection between philosophy and religion, in Eastern philosophy, there is a connection between religion and philosophy, so these are the, some of the basic distinctions between Western and Eastern philosophies, if you do want me to, again, I'm mentioning, if you want me to discuss it, do comment down below, and I will happy 
happily do it but once we finish history of english literature and literary criticism okay so with uh, that understanding now let's move on uh, forward so he's credited as the founder of western philosophy he is known as the father of philosophy and uh, the irony is that he did not write a single essay on philosophy whatever we know of him today is through the posthumous accounts of classical writers particularly his students plato and xenophon now see he did not even author one text on philosophy he did not write essays on philosophy but he is known uh, as the first philosopher he is known as the father of philosophy why it is because of his ideas it's because of his way of life it's because of the beliefs that he had now see i'll just give an example suppose today i do not write any books okay i don't write books i don't author books i don't consider myself also as a philosopher but i'm conversing with you and when i'm conversing with you i share my ideas that okay if i think about life this is what i think okay if i think about courage if i think about the concept of love all these abstract ideas this is my belief i talk to you when i talk to you i share my beliefs okay but i don't write or write down my beliefs anywhere i'm just sharing it with you later maybe some of my students might write a book and in that book they might mention me and then they would write about my ideas say so uh, say socrates wrote this or socrates believed in this you know you understand it's like that we look at the nature of the works later and the problems with the works also but just know this that his students and his contemporaries were the ones who actually mentioned him in their works and whatever we know of socrates today is through these works of their students and contemporary greek writers okay so he himself did not author any books but then his students and his contemporaries wrote okay of him and mentioned his ideas also in their books so plato was a student of socrates he wrote works in which he shared the ideas of socrates and he also included socrates as a character in his works so this is all about the concrete facts of socrates now we're going to move on further now see i have just mentioned that socrates is known as the father of philosophy because of the way uh, of life he led and the ideas that he had okay and one such idea one such philosophy okay which he actually um, believed in which he propounded okay is full of wisdom okay this is something which he has said whatever we're going to discuss now this is something which he believed in and whatever this whatever i'm going to tell you now it is full of wisdom okay and it is it is he was so wise and rightly so uh years before he died the oracle at delphi prophesied something okay so what is an oracle okay oracle uh, is a high priestess okay she is if you have watched greek movies and you've read greek literature okay if you've watched to say percy jackson series of rick riordan uh, there also you have an oracle if you've watched the movie uh percy jackson the lightning thief so an oracle actually she has visions and then she prophesizes the future okay so uh the this uh, oracle her name was pythia okay so pythia was the name of the um uh, uh pythia okay was the name of this high priestess of the temple of apollo at delphi so she was the high priestess who is a high priest or who is a high priestess or a high priest is it usually refers to either an individual who holds office of a ruler priest or one who is head of a religious organization okay so uh, pythia was the person to whom everybody would go okay for um, advice she would have visions then she would guide the people and then she would see uh, it's not that there's just one oracle oracles can be many okay and oracles what they used to do they used to prophesy they could see the future they used to have visions people used to go to them for advice and guidance okay so oracle this oracle pythia okay who um, was the high priestess of the temple of apollo at delphi she's the god of archery okay apollo is the god of archery music light prophecy arts and healing okay so in this temple she was the high priestess pythia and she is the one who actually prophesies that socrates is the wisest person in athens okay why is it so she said that socrates is the wisest person is in athens now socrates okay like he's a teacher he's a philosopher and there are people of power in athens people who make laws people who whose word okay people listen to there are people with power and prestige okay in athens who were ruling at the time and 
in front of them the oracle is saying that the wisest person in athens is socrates so do you think that they will like it i don't think so anytime power hungry people they feel threatened you know they always want to eliminate the threat okay they do not like um uh, uh the threat they do not like um uh, uh, competition so you know the oracle is saying socrates is the wisest person in athens why okay he is said to have concluded that nobody knew anything okay and hence he was wise because he recognized his own ignorance now see this is something which my father also repeatedly tells me if you think someday that you know everything and you're the wisest of all no that is the beginning of your foolery you're the biggest fool that day the day you think that you know better than everyone because nobody actually knows anything see we actually are studying today we are striving for a job we are actually um uh, get, striving to get good marks and everything the moment you consider yourself just out of the earth imagine this is the earth and you're just standing outside of it in space does it make sense do you actually know what the universe is about do you actually know what's your purpose in life also no right we don't actually know what's going to happen tomorrow also so you know the wisest thing that he has prophesied uh, the wisest thing that he has philosophized okay or you know this is not something he wrote down it is something he believed in in his way of life that nobody actually knew anything so why is socrates why did the oracle say that socrates is the wisest person is in athens it's because because he himself recognized his own ignorance this prob this is probably why the oracle at delphi prophesied so socrates was a polarizing figure in athens society in 1399 bc he was accused of impiety and corrupting the youth after a trial that lasted a day he was sentenced to death he spent his last day in prison refusing help to aid him in escaping okay so like i said you see the people in par okay they wouldn't like competition they wouldn't like it at all because they are the ones who want to control things okay but because of socrates's ideas his beliefs okay uh, he was trying to actually tilt that par okay he was not he did not strive for par he did not want political power or anything to do with a a a, a, a religious post or anything nothing he did not have anything to do with religion or politics he just questioned people he just believed it's his beliefs and ideas he was questioning people and through that questioning he was trying to actually reveal people's beliefs that did not sit well with the people in par okay so he was tried he was accused of actually corrupting the youth in athens and then he um, was imprisoned after the trial he was sentenced to death and we'll look at it in detail also and then he was uh, he spent his last day in prison his friends everybody uh, like um, uh, visited him they offered him help that we'll help you escape but he denied it he actually uh, stood by the rule and he accepted his death penalty okay he did not he refused help also so and that's how he died okay in 399 bc now see what happens is uh socrates uh, socrates no he used to question people like um uh, we'll discuss about this okay we'll as we go just for now you remember he questioned people like he believed that nobody knew anything okay he also believed that he himself also did not know anything so he will go and ask somebody imagine it's a person of uh, a person who has a lot of power imagine okay somebody who maybe makes laws in greek uh, in greece he's part of the political sphere okay in uh, greece and he's asking this person that what do you think is life then the person will reply that i think life is this 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 then he will cross question if life is this 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 then what do you think is the essence of life now he will cross question so much that in the end the person he is uh, questioning okay the person who he is questioning will forget what he said in the beginning he'll actually contradict himself when he did this when he cross question and kept questioning his uh, uh, interlocutors this to say okay interlocutors that means the person who takes part in the debate okay when he's questioning this person in front of him he'll cross question cross question his point was to establish the fact even the person did not know anything like you can pretend that you know a lot of things but at the end we know nothing okay his point was to establish that that whatever he's saying it makes no sense at all that nobody has any idea if you say love you cannot for concrete and for real say what love is okay it's impossible almost to define it many people will have many things to say about love but the essence of love we cannot really explain it, it it's we cannot really uh, express it in a way to understand okay so his point socrates when he used to cross question his interlocutors that means the people who are taking part in the debate 
when he used to cross cross question the interlocutors at the end his object was to establish that nobody knew anything okay and then he did not even want to say that i know everything he himself proclaimed that even i don't know anything so you know let's not pretend that kind of a thing okay so this is about socrates okay now we'll move on to the socratic dialogue which i had uh, talked about we're going to talk about this cross questioning thing okay like how he used to cross question his interlocutors so let us like move on and now we're going into slowly we are diving deep into his philosophies okay so let's get right into it okay so now we're going to talk about the socratic dialogue okay so socrates authored no text okay just in the previous slide i've actually detailed out and explained everything you need to know and understand about the socratic dialogue so these are just points you need to remember so socrates authored no texts like i've just mentioned okay posthumous accounts of his contemporaries students and other greek philosophers are the ones that tell us about his beliefs and ideas and philosophies okay now these accounts are written in dialogues okay in which socrates and his interlocutors who are interlocutors i've mentioned this also it is a person who takes part in a dialogue or conversation so his interlocutors the people who are taking part in this conversation with him socrates and interlocutors it is a dialogue between them and they examine a subject in a style of question and answer why dialogue in drama we have dialogues right character one says this character two says that it's similar to that socratic dialogue you'll have socrates saying this 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 then one of his interlocutors as characters replying or saying this 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 so it's like similar to that so they examine a subject it can be any subject okay it, they examine a subject in a style of question and answers subject as in not like our history math science and all subject in the sense like um, a, a concept it can be love it can be courage it can be life it can be abstract ideas it can be concrete stuff they can talk about laws so it's about it can be anything they're going to talk about it in the form of question and answer now this form of questioning and answering gave rise to the socratic dialogue literary genre so now we have a literary genre itself which is known as the socratic dialogue literary genre so what are the few things that you have to remember about the socratic dialogue that it developed in greece in the turn of the fourth century bc that the earliest ones are preserved in the works of plato and xenophon that all involves socrates as the protagonist and it is in the form of question and answers okay so this is very short and crisp i think it is very clear now we are going to move on with the socratic problem Okay, so guys, now we're going to talk about the Socratic problem. Now, see, contradictory accounts of Socrates makes a reconstruction of his philosophy nearly impossible. A situation known as the Socratic problem. Now, see, the thing is, we all know that Socrates himself did not write any books. He did not author any texts. He did not write down his ideas anywhere. Whatever we know is from his pupils, from his students, or from the contemporaries. Okay, now what happens is there are two three pupils suppose who are writing about him and then you have two three contemporaries writing about him all the details in these different works they don't match sometimes there's a difference between um uh, uh, the accounts of socrates about him the the whatever they write about him there's difference in the accounts um between the contemporaries like aristophanes and then his disciples like plato and xenophon the accounts of both they don't match the contradictory statements about socrates's life sometimes uh, there are differences in details also between plato and xenophon his own pupils his own students they differ in some of the details okay we'll see that as we move forward i've given examples also so um, what happens is the accounts don't match okay so we are trying to reconstruct socrates's life through other people's works right and the thing is these people who are writing about him about his ideas and his philosophies whatever they are writing they don't add up sometimes so this makes the reconstruction of his philosophy very difficult and this is known as a socratic problem this is a problem why because they don't match okay so this is known as a socratic problem now like i've just said okay that the accounts of these uh, writers okay the accounts of these philosophers don't add up okay they don't match in certain respects so in that sense we're going to look at plato's socrates 
and then we're going to contrast it with Xenophon's uh, uh, Socrates okay so what Plato wrote about Socrates and what Xenophon uh, wrote we're going to look at that so who is Plato's Socrates what did Plato write about Socrates okay so Plato's dialogues are among the most comprehensive accounts of Socrates that survive from antiquity what is antiquity it is classical studies of uh, a study of the past classical Greek writings okay classical period okay the um, the ancient period that is known as antiquity okay so um th this is uh, plato's dialogues are the ones who give us the most comprehensive idea of socrates's uh, beliefs okay now uh, platonic socrates lends his name to the concept of socratic method it is through plato's works whatever plato wrote about socrates that gives us the socratic method that's where the socratic method comes for example again just to make it clear i never wrote something which will say that this is my method okay of teaching or this is my method of uh or talking or something like that it's not something which i wrote my pupils will write about me suppose how i teach in a book and when scholars will study that book will research on it it will give rise to this method a particular method which i follow in the same sense socrates did not write any books like i've said later his students wrote about him wrote um, uh, a particular way they wrote the socratic dialogue this questioning method they wrote about it scholars researched on it many people researched and saw that yes it was a particular method adopted and this is called the uh, socratic method a form of argumentative dialogue between individuals based on asking and answering questions okay so this is the socratic dialogue that i said so it's the socratic method what is the socratic method this questioning and answering which involves a dialogue dialogue between um, uh, socrates or or two people or interlocutors socrates and his interlocutors and it is based on asking and answering questions okay so this is the socratic method and also it gave when you study plato's text you will understand that there's something known as the socratic theory what is the socratic theory the dissimulation of ignorance practiced by socrates as a means for confusing and adversary that means he knew suppose he knows okay suppose he has an idea of what courage is when he'll question his interlocutor he'll pretend he doesn't know you know he'll pretend like he's ignorant okay he doesn't know about it so he'll ask him questions he'll cross question and towards the end you know the person who's answering his questions himself will be uh, confused okay now see this is very uh, wise and it is very uh, clever also okay in order to pro prove a point this is a very clever way how see okay suppose you already know the definition to something you know what is the definition of a noun okay suppose you know what is the definition of a noun then you go to somebody and ask what is a noun and the person replies and you know that is wrong the definition that he's giving is wrong but you'll pretend to be ignorant you're like oh okay this is a noun then can you give examples then he'll start giving examples you know that that is also wrong because his definition is only wrong then after that you'll cross question him again to the point that at the end the person who's replying to you will be confused because he actually doesn't know anything so you know the dissimulation of ignorance he pretends to be ignorant okay and he questions his interlocutors and it is a means adopted for confusing his adversary whoever he is having this debate with he confuses them so socratic method dialogue questioning and answering socratic theory that you have even if you know everything you know if you know a certain thing you pretend to be ignorant dissimulation of ignorance okay in order to confuse his uh, adversary that is the socratic theory okay then you have the socratic paradox what is the socratic paradox socrates is known to have proclaimed his total ignorance okay he proclaimed that he he does not know anything okay I know that I know nothing is a saying derived from Plato's account of the Greek philosopher Socrates seeking to imply that the realization of our ignorance is the first step to philosophizing so he's a father of philosophy why it is because he believed he knew nothing once you believe that you know nothing you will go out on a quest for wisdom you will go out you will you know once you think that you know everything 
you will have that ego right that i don't need to know anything i don't need to read anything i have an idea of what everything is about you know you'll have that ego in you but the moment you think i don't know anything you will go out on a quest for knowledge you'll go out on a quest for wisdom that is the basis of philosophizing according to him that the moment you realize that you don't know anything that is the first step to philosophizing that you will go out on a quest for research you will go out on a quest for wisdom okay so this is the socratic paradox he's so wise but he says that i know that i know nothing this is what i know this is the paradox i know that i know nothing so this is plato's socrates now we'll look at xenophon socrates okay so first we look at a few works of xenophon's where he does discuss socrates okay we are going to look at plato's works when we discuss plato so here we're discussing xenophon so therefore we look at the four works where he mentions and talks about socrates okay so uh, the first is memorabilia the second is o economicus the third is symposium and the fourth is apology of socrates to the jury okay so these are the four works where he discusses uh, socrates now in memorabilia it is a collection of socratic dialogues again it is the socratic dialogue by xenophon a student of socrates the lengthiest and most famous of xenophon socratic writings the memorabilia is essentially an apology or defense of socrates differing from both xenophon's apology of socrates to the jury and plato's apology so plato's apology okay uh, uh, when we'll do plato i'll talk about the apology there just know that there's a work by plato plato's apology and then you have another work by xenophon himself that fourth work which i've mentioned apology of socrates to the jury so this is a defense of socrates you know that he was accused and then tried and then he was given the death penalty so this is a defense of socrates okay so this memorabilia differs from both it is different Memor memorabilia is different from apology of socrates to the jury by xenophon and plato's apology okay they talk about the similar thing but it's different okay it's different from each other so um mainly that the apologies this apology of socrates to the jury and plato's apology these apologies is socrates okay when you read them it is the character of socrates himself defending himself he defends himself in front of the jury okay so he is defending himself before the jury in the trial okay during the trial that is apology by plato's apology and apology of socrates to the jury here the character of socrates he himself is defending himself but in memorabilia it is xenophon who's defending socrates okay it is not it's not socrates who's saying that i am giving this 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 reason uh, or he's the one defending himself it's xenophon who's defending socrates okay so again memorabilia is the lengthiest account okay by xenophon on socrates now what do you have to remember is it differs from plato's apology and this fourth work by xenophon apology of socrates to the jury it differs how that the two apologies there you have the character of socrates himself defending himself and here you have xenophon in memorabilia xenophon is the one who is uh, he's giving his own defense for socrates okay he's defending socrates so offering edifying examples of socrates's conversations and activities along with occasional commentary from xenophon okay this is memorabilia o economicus is a discussion of practical agricultural issues then you have symposium okay this is differ this differs from plato's symposium okay there's another work by plato which is entitled symposium and this is also symposium by xenophon they differ from each other now here xenophon symposium is a dialogue of socrates with other prominent athenians during an after dinner discussion okay in an after dinner discussion plato is um, uh, discussing with prominent athenians okay so uh, he's writing about that how does it differ with plato's symposium the guest list don't overlap whatever the prominent athenians the guests that are there in the after dinner discussion right it is not the same in plato's account in plato's account the guests are different okay so it differs from plato's symposium the guests list do not overlap so the guests that the athenians that are there in um, xenophon's that feature in xenophon's uh, uh, symposium 
these guests are different from Plato's um, uh, uh, guest list. They, these are different from the Athenians who appear in Plato's symposium. So these are different. Okay. Then you have the last one, Apology of Socrates to the Jury. It is a Socratic dialogue about the legal defense that philosopher Socrates presented at his trial for the moral corruption of Athenian youth and for the impiety or Asebea against the um, pantheon of Athens okay so you know what they accused him of is corrupting the youth and worshipping false gods because of his belief system right so like they took it as a threat so that's what they actually accused him of now an apology by Plato Plato's apology an apology of Socrates to the jury it's Socrates's own defense okay uh, uh, for um, uh, in front of the jury during his trial so that also some parts of the two they differ from each other okay they differ from each other so you see the similar work symposium similar then you have the apologies similar but then the the details in them differ from each other a little bit so these are the four works that you have to remember remember by um, uh, Xenophon and now we're going to move on to the inaccuracies we're going to go and look at the inaccuracy in the accounts okay Okay, so let's have a look at the inaccuracies. Now, as far as Plato is concerned, okay, so I'll just give you an example of what the inaccuracies are like. So Plato's representation of Socrates is not straightforward. How trustworthy Plato is in representing Socrates is a matter of debate. So this debate is still going on. Research is still going on. Um, and a driver of this debate is the inconsistency of the character of Socrates, which he presents. So there's inconsistencies in the character that he represents. The character of Socrates, which he presents in his earlier works and later works, there are inconsistencies in the two, okay? One common explanation of this inconsistency is that Plato initially tried to accurately represent the historical Socrates, while in his later writings, he was happy to insert his own views into Socrates' own words. Okay, so what happens in what they are trying to debate and what the debate is about is that maybe in the beginning, he actually accurately tried to portray um, Socrates historical Socrates, the actual Socrates, he tried to portray him accurately. But in his later works, he felt free to like, you know, experiment and add his own words into Socrates's character. Okay, so he tried to this is what leads to the inconsistency. There's a debate that's going on. So under this understanding, there is a difference between the Socratic Socrates in Plato's earlier works and the Platonic Socrates in his later works. So there's Socratic Socrates as in the accurate one, the actual attempt to depict him and uh, talk about him accurately, okay? His accounts accurately presented. There's Socratic Socrates in Plato's earlier works and there's Platonic Socrates, that is where he added his own ideas, his own words, okay, into Socrates' character. So, you know, there's this Platonic Socrates in his later works, although the boundary between the two seem blurred. So, you know, this is a debate that's going on. I'm just giving you an example of the kind of inaccuracies that exist. There's a debate that's going on that there's an inconsistency between the earlier works and later works, okay, where he depicts Socrates and uh, the boundary between the two are blurred, okay, it's very um, uh, blurry, it's not as concrete that, okay, there's distinct um, uh, distinctions between the two, but there are differences and there's still research going on on that, okay, so this is one example, now we're going to move on with another philosophy of Socrates, so let's just get into it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Socratic eudaimonism and intellectualism, okay? So, for Socrates, the pursuit of eudaimonia, sometimes recognized as eudaimonia and eudaimonia, motivates all human actions directly and indirectly. So, we have to know what is eudaimonia. So, it is a Greek word which literally translates to the state of good spirit in which commonly, which we would understand as laymen, it commonly translates to happiness or welfare. So what he believed in, what Socrates believed in, was that, you know, eudaimonia is what we pursue. This welfare, good spirit, um, this happiness in life is what, what we human beings uh, are in pursuit of, directly or indirectly. Sometimes we say, right, that all we need is peace, all we need is happiness. We don't want troubles in life, okay? So what we want is a good spirit, happiness and welfare, okay? Eudaimonia, this is what we are in pursuit of according to Socrates. So he says virtue and knowledge are linked according to Socrates' views, but how closely they are linked is still a matter of debate. So virtue and knowledge, okay, our virtues, our values, our principles, virtue and knowledge are 
con connected with each other to how far they are connected it's still being debated it's still a matter of research okay people are researching on it debating on it now some say that virtue and eudaimonia are identical that this happiness and welfare is virtue itself okay it's if we lead a virtuous life we will have happiness okay and uh, uh, welfare therefore virtue and um, uh, eudaimonia are the same okay identical others say that virtue is a means to eudaimonia you know the fact that uh, we will achieve happiness through virtues by being virtuous. That's why they're saying it's a way. That it is a way to achieve eudaimonia, to achieve happiness. If you're virtuous, you will be happy. Another, another point of debate is whether, according to Socrates, people desire what is in fact good or rather simply what they perceive as good. That we as human beings, when we, we, we want something in life, what we desire, do we desire things that are actually good? In fact, reality, in reality, are they good? Or what, according to us, is good? What do we desire? That's another point of debate, okay? So let's come to moral intellectualism, okay? It refers to prominent role that Socrates gave to knowledge, okay? He says, or he believed that all virtue was based on knowledge, he believed that humans were guided by the cognitive power to comprehend uh, what they desire and not impulse, okay, not behave impulsively. So moral intellectualism, see, he believed that virtue and knowledge are connected, okay, and he says that all virtue was based on knowledge. If you know what is good, if you know what is honesty, if you know what the real meaning of these virtues, if you know them, you will want to be like them. You would want to stand by them, okay? And that will lead to eudaimonia, okay? And he believed that all humans have this cognitive power, cognitive as in the brain. You have the power to comprehend what you want. You know, you when you want something, when you desire something, you can sit and actually think whether whatever you're asking for, does it make sense or not? Some, you know, if you want, say, a book, okay, you want to read a book, you sit and you ask yourself that, uh, is this book something you really want? And then you sit and you read, you ask yourself, will it be helpful for you or not the book? Then you have books and books and books and books you buy, but you don't read. And you don't sit and you ask yourselves that do you need these books or not? So, you know, you're not using your cognitive power then, you're using that, that, that greed or that impulse, right, to go and get more stuff without actually sitting and asking yourself if you need them or not. This is just an example I'm giving. So what he's saying that we do not have to act on impulse. We have the ability to sit and comprehend. So he says all virtue, all the virtues that we keep, honesty, truth, um, kindness, we will keep them if we have a knowledge of them. If we know what kindness is, if we know what virtue is, then we will want to be like that because these are virtues. And all these virtues, living a virtuous life and knowledge of them will lead to eudaimonia. That is, they will lead to happiness, they will lead to welfare. So in Socratic philosophy, priority is given to the intellect as being a way to live a good life. Okay, your intellect. The more you have knowledge, the more you understand things, your intellect will pave the way for you to make the right decisions, to, uh, to, to live a good life. Okay, so intellectual motivation can be found in Plato's dialogues in Georgius and Mino. Okay, this, this you can just remember. Then in Plato's dialogues, you'll find uh, intellectual motivation. So intellectual motivation, you'll find in Plato's dialogues. And what are these dialogues? Georgius and Mino. Okay, so Georgius and Mino, you'll find intellectualism. So we're done with Socratic, Eudaimonism and intellectualism. Now we'll move on to one other part of his philosophy, which will be the last one. Then we'll move on to the last part of the section, uh, last part of the video, where we'll discuss, we'll discuss Socrates' trial and we'll be done with Socrates. Okay, so let's just look at one other philosophy philosophy of his and move on further. Okay, so let's have a look at Socratic Diamonian. Okay, so in several texts, Socrates claims that he hears a diamonic sign, an inner voice heard usually when he is about to make a mistake. So in other words, he's talking about his conscience. Okay, it started in my childhood, the occurrence of a particular voice. Whenever it occurs, it always deters me from the course of action I was intended to engage in. But it never gives me positive advice. Positive advice as in it does not support him. When he's about to make a mistake, it does not give positive advice. That means don't do it. 
you know so it's a negative advice that don't do it so whenever he's about to make a mistake he talks about this diamonic sign this inner voice his conscience telling him that not to do it okay not giving him the go you know that don't do it so you see these are virtues these are principles which we are taught in today's time and this is what he talked about in bc okay in the bc era okay before and these are like thousands of year old um philosophies hundreds of year old philosophies and they've stayed with us till today okay we go by them even today so you know you can understand his wisdom the fact that he was called wise it's because of these kind of thoughts that he had now when you talk about virtue and knowledge according to him socrates states that all virtues are essentially one since they are a form of knowledge so he considers virtues to be knowledge themselves honesty truth kindness you know benevolence these are all virtues and they form they are a form of knowledge for socrates the reason why a person is not good is because they lack knowledge you know a person will not be good will always do the wrong thing because they lack knowledge knowledge of these things they don't know what is truth they don't know what is kindness they have not seen the world in that lens only and that is why they are bad according to socrates so aristotle comments that socrates the elder thought that the end of life was knowledge of virtue and he, you see he is saying it's aristotle talking about socrates and he says that socrates the elder thought that the pursuit of knowledge was the end goal of life okay that the end of life was knowledge of virtue and he used to seek for definition since he thought that all virtues are sciences and that as soon as one knew for example justice he would be just so he considered the virtues to be sciences themselves he he said that if you know once you know the meaning of for example justice you would be just you know it's because we don't know what justice is that's why we make mistakes it's because we don't know the uh, 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 what kindness is we don't know what these virtues are we don't know the definitions we don't have a knowledge of them that's why we make mistakes once we have knowledge of them we will not make mistakes we'll stand by these virtues that is what um, a virtue and knowledge is according to socrates now we're going to move to the final section which is socrates' trial so let's get right into it Okay so guys we've reached the last section of the video which is the trial of Socrates we've already talked about it before so we're just going to look at it very shortly we'll just take an overview okay very quickly in 399 BC Socrates was formally accused of corrupting the minds of the youth of Athens and for a sebea impiety that is worshiping false gods and failing to worship the god of Athens at the trial Socrates defended himself unsuccessfully he was found guilty by majority of the vote cast by a jury of hundreds of male Athenian citizens and according to custom proposed his own penalty that he should be given free food and housing by the state of the for the services he rendered to the city on the alternative he proposed that he be fined one mina of silver according to him all he had so you see the wisdom of socrates here again okay uh, the way he's talking when they said that what will you what penalty will you give the 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 rule in athens at the time was that the person who was found guilty can uh, choose his own uh, penalty he can choose how, what his penalty will be so socrates says that he should be given free food and housing by the state for the services he rendered to the city so he knows okay socrates knew like his wisdom he knew the knowledge that he had that he knew how he contributed to the society he knew that his uh, teachings his philosophy did contribute will contribute in the times to come he knew that was his wisdom and it's rightly so it's because till today we're studying him that means he did something worthwhile okay and he his views do um uh, stand tall and on the alternative when this was not um, agreed upon he proposed that he find be find one mina of silver that means it's a uh, you can say it's a measure okay one mina of silver that's the only thing he had he offered to give it away also but uh, the jurors declined his offer and ordered the death penalty by drinking a cup of hemlock hemlock is a poisonous liquid so that's how he was sentenced to death he was to drink a cup of hemlock and that's how he died now um 
again different accounts right so plato according to plato socrates made no proposals okay that's uh, uh socrates made proposals okay and according to xenophon socrates did not give any proposals like the two penalties no the proposals that he gave according to xenophon he did not give any proposals and according to plato he did so again difference of accounts okay now the question of what motivated the athenians to convict socrates remains controversial among scholars some suggest it was on religious grounds others suggest that it might be for political reasons and recent theories even suggest that the state and religion were not separate in ancient athens so you know we don't know why um, uh, people were so triggered uh, why and what motivated the athenians to uh, convict him uh these are the few opinions that we have today of what might be the reason behind it but um, he did um, uh, he was offered help by his friends he spent his last day in prison and his friends did visit him uh, like and also offered to give him a uh, aid him in escaping the prison but he declined all of that okay he accepted the penalty and with this we are done with socrates we're going to move on to plato in the next video and i really hope that this video was helpful for you if it has then don't forget to like the video share the video and subscribe to my channel for all things literature until we meet again stay healthy stay happy and see you in the next one